but they canceled the flights starting in the middle of the month, right after we were going to go. So we had to change our plans. But anyway, we are extremely happy to be here. And we are grateful for the wonderful, warm welcome that you have given us. And we are grateful to the Appletons for inviting us and for hosting us. I was not expecting to be asked to give a presentation, but I'm very happy to do so. So without uh, further ado, let me, we could dim the lights perhaps. And do we not have more chairs for people who have to stand in the back? There are some chairs. I don't, I'm not like for you to have to stand in the small. There's two here. There's one here. There are two chairs right here. <laughs> And I hope the rest of you won't fall asleep during the presentation because the chairs and the sofas look so comfortable. So I titled the talk today as The Back of Beyond, Sacred Spaces in the Outback Mountains of Mongolia. You understand that expression, the back of beyond? The beyond is so far away, beyond. And the back of beyond is back of that. So this place in Mongolia is really the back of beyond. Very few uh, travelers have gone to places that I have explored. Some of the places that I will show you are, I'm the only uh, outsider who have ever seen them, and even including Mongolians. I've been to places that just have not been stepped foot in. So it's a very exciting place. It's a very colorful place. Spinning round and round we go, and where we stop is Mongolia. So that gives a sort of global northern view, polar view of where it will be. So here is a tiny version of Mongolia with its neighbors. Russia to the north, China to the south, east and west. Kazakhstan just kissing it up in the in the far west. So it's a very interesting place, geopolitically, as well as historically and culturally, where these countries, Mongolia, China, Russia, and Kazakhstan, converge. Mongolia is, is quickly undergoing figure out where the spine is. It's quite a little So here's Mongolia, the 16th largest country in the world. In the far west, where we're going in the peak, it's called Bayanoldi Aymat, or province. And that's 90% Kazakh. So they're very interesting issues about language. So people ask me if I speak Mongolian and I say I don't know a few expressions because where I go, where I spend my summers, they speak Kazakh, Russian. So I haven't been able to learn both of them really at all. So here's a close up of Bai and And our study area is there in the red circle, right on the border with Xinjiang in China. The high mountains run down to the upper left to the lower right. That's the Altai range called the Altai Nuru. Here it is again. The red circle is the site that I have been um, exploring, documenting, researching for the last almost 20 years. 
Here it is again at Tombo. Now, this area with the three lakes, Hotan Lake, Kurgan Lake, and Diane Lake, were formed by glaciers. This is a glacier basin. The glacier has retreated from the lower right to the upper left, but it's still there in the upper left in the high mountains. It's a very large glacier. So here's a close. There's another petroglyph spot at the upper end of the lake called Aratogo, but that only has several hundreds of images. At Balut, so far, we have documented 12,000. So here we are crossing the plains into the high mountains of the Alta. Along the way, you see many interesting things. This is a sacred ovo. It's a pile of stones. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're extremely large. The tradition is to walk around it three times and leave a stone on the pile. And that's to ensure good luck on your journey. All kinds of things show up in the ovos. We pass through a small Tsengo village. And there is a small mosque there, which we visited. And the caretaker was kind enough to allow me in. And I was a little bit worried because my first trip was in 2004, right after the Gulf War had erupted. And so as an American, I was a little bit concerned about traveling in a Muslim country until the caretaker assured me and the rest of my team by grabbing us all together including a Buddhist, a Muslim, and Americans, that we were all brothers. And then I knew I was in safe company. So there's something called Mongolia time, which is not clock time. It just runs according to Mongolia. You can't expect to be any place at a certain time so, getting there, here we got stuck behind this broken down truck for over an hour. It's a little difficult to tell, but we were on a very steep mountain slope, so there was no going up around or down below. Finally, using gestures and charade, I coaxed him the driver into putting it into neutral, putting the clutch on, and coasting the rest of the way down the track until we could pass. But it took an hour to do If you cross bridges that are so rickety, you can't, you can't stay in the vehicle because it's going to tip over and tip into the river. So everyone has to get out and walk behind it and there's not room to walk beside it. It's just some boards laying on top of other boards and they all fly up if you drive across and somebody has to go back and put them back in place. Often there are yaks on these things or goats. Right river. This is just a, a glacial runoff in the early spring when the glaciers have melted and we have to cross these streams that are swollen. And you get stuck. So I always try to travel with at least two vehicles and a, and a cable. So in this case, the Jeep pulled the van out of the river. Getting there, tap the fun. The next little crossing, the Jeep got stuck up to its axle. And the van had to roll across and rescue us. So you begin to get a glimmer of what I mean by Mongolian time. The journey from the capital city of the province, Ulti City, to Hotan Lake is only 110 kilometers, about 70 miles. And you're lucky if you make it in 10 hours. Sometimes we don't make it in a single day. So 
Sometimes we had to cross rivers on a sort of homemade barge, pulling ourselves across the, on the cable. So it's quite exciting. And our neighbors come in on their horses and camels with their belongings to set up their camp. Sometimes I'm going on horseback. Sometimes on the back of a yak. These were our nearest neighbors, a family that came through in the early summer to graze their goats and horses before moving on to higher ground at the end of summer. Horses are du rigueur. Horses are the way of life. For two of these people have vehicles. There are no paved roads, only rough tracks that shift and change. This man was proudly displaying to me his silver belt, his fox fur hat, and the silver on his saddle. And the, they're legendary for their hospitality. Here's a mother giving the daughter a scalding hot bath in the kettle. <laughs> you can see, it's not so pleasurable. And here we're arriving at our site, the three Galoot Hills, as we call them. They're small mountains, but compared to the surrounding mountains, they look like hills. On the left is Galoot 1, and the center is Galoot 2, and to the right is Galoot 3, also known locally as Juniper Mountain. Here it is from the north. You can see this is a fantastic landscape. And nobody lives here permanently. Only in summer do a scattered group of families come through to graze and leave, and it's empty. And the vastness is almost overpowering. In some places you can see 20 or 30 miles, and there's not a hint of a human being. These are photos of the lake and mountains. The ridge line of those mountains is the border with Xinjiang. Then on the right, with that last little bit of ice, that's where we have our camp. So here we are in camp. This is uh, 2011. I had a large grant from the National Endowment for Humanities for almost a quarter million dollars. So I was able to afford having 40 people in camp. And the next summer, in 2012, I had 50. It was almost like a tent city. In 2007, I took some colleagues, a surveyor and a geologist, and we precisely mapped all the petroglyphs on the middle hill, all 1,600 of them, to within five centimeters. When we document the petroglyphs, we try to do it systematically and scientifically, and we record over 28 data points. And these are some of them, what kind of figure it is, what age it's from, how large it is, what's its latitude and longitude and elevation, what kind of style, how it's made, technique, and so on. And this is a picture of one of the data sheets from the field with actual recording on it. Including the time of day and what the weather is like, everything. The study is multinational and multidisciplinary. I have researchers on my team from seven or eight countries over the years and many disciplines, as you can see. My wish list at the bottom is to get an archaeoastronomer, because I'm 
convinced that some of the petroglyphs are representations of constellations. Because at night, there is no light pollution whatsoever out here in the mountains. And the sky is dark, and the Milky Way looks like you could just reach up and pluck it from the sky. It's really extraordinary. It's overpowering. left row on the, what we call the giant horse rock. These are the, probably the largest petroglyphs over here on the left of horse riders marauding across this large rock face. They are eight and a half feet from nose to tail. Probably the largest petroglyphs in Central Asia. These are some of the analytic maps we make where we, we locate every period, whether it's Bronze Age or Iron Age, And this is a map of the southern part of the Middle Hills showing the location of all the different petroglyphs of all the different ages. You can see how they're grouped and bunched together. And here's a shot just walking across building one facing the lake, which you can see is, is still frozen over very largely. And we also make tracings on plastic with felt pens. So we could take those back home to the lab and we could study them further. This is my workspace in the summer. Not too bad, eh? There's an archer. around quite high in the snow and ice. We search every stone. It's just a map of any team. We search every stone for any marks of any kind. Some of them are marked boulders like this, which contain sometimes a hundred figures. This is a picture of David Edwards. He's a photojournalist who has credits with National Geographic. And you, you can look up um, the eagle hunters of Kazakh Mongolia, which he specializes in. He has some dramatic photos. And here he's trying to get a photograph, an angle from above of the giant horse rock, which as you can see is slanted away from him. And then later we got some more sophisticated equipment. We had a telescoping pole here with a GoPro lens on top. And one of my students, Taylor Malone, was struggling to keep it up there to get some photo. So this is just a chart that, that shows the petroglyphs by cultural period on each of the locations. 95% of the petroglyphs are on Blue 1, Blue 2, and Blue 3. And then there's a smattering on three other sites. But you can see by far the largest percentage is Bronze Age, almost three quarters. And then Iron Age. But it varies according to the hill. So if you look at Balut 2 at the top and go down, you'll see that Iron Age is 50% of petroglyphs on Balut 2. And on Springhouse Bluffs and Broken Mountain, it's over 90% Bronze Age. So it's interesting. We at first assumed that the location of the petroglyphs, where they made them, was opportunistic. Wherever they found a good, clean, empty, glacially polished surface, that's where they would put something. So we thought it would just be random. But now, because we have recorded everything scientifically and systematically, we have found that that's not the case. It's far from the case. There are very clear statistical differences with different figure types of humans or horses or deer at different locations. It's very interesting. It's something mysterious. We don't understand it yet. But it's clear that they chose these places carefully. This is a, a fabulous deer stone 
a very tall kilometers of cliff, which is decorated with these so-called flying deer, or Mongolian deer. I don't know if you've ever seen them or heard of them. They're really fabulous. Legs tucked in underneath, and the antlers like huge waves extending all the way to the rump. And the nose extended way out front. And I've just come out with an article in Current World Archaeology about these clints and what we think they mean. There are about 1,600 across all of Mongolia. Some of them, of course, are not found. Some are buried. Some we find just under the surface and we dig them up. This is a particular kind called the Eurasian deer, so which doesn't have any deer on it at all, but it has all the other attributes. It has a slanted top. It has a large circle at the top, which is either a son or a moon. It has a bead, which is called a necklace. And it has tools floating down. The let me go back a little bit. Okay, no So down in the middle area, there's a chariot implement. And the ring, if you see the ring up top, and it has a little thing dangling from it, it is actually an earring on the side of the face. Here's one for size. This is my wife gazing up at one. This is a very rare one that actually has a face carved in three dimensions on it. Most of it don't actually have a face, they have three slashes that indicate a face. But this one at the top, you can see the protruding face. This is called a stone man, or a man stone. This is an extremely large one. This is from the Turkic period, which is about 550 to 800 AD, or in the common era. In one hand, the man is holding a cup probably for hospitality, and the other hand a knife blade. <laughs> and has a mustache. All the, most of them are much smaller. This is a terrific burial which had three stone men. Very beautiful one. This is a rare one that has a face which is three-dimensional. And here we are on Baluch's wall looking over the lake towards the mountains in Xinjiang. And this is a circle of stones with a mound in the center. The mound is called a hearing circle. It's a barrier. It's not dug out. The ground was prepared burning to purify and then the body was laid on the ground, and a pile of stones was put over it. Some of these are rather small, very modest, and some of them are extremely large. They can be uh, 10 meters in height. And this one has a very, this one has a very small deer stone over on its right to the mound, if you can see it. This is what's called a square burial, and each of the corners face the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, which is marked by a very large stone. This is a large heritzer, about 70 meters across. And it's, it's unusual because it is built in a spoke, ring, form. We don't know what that means. There have been many suggestions that it represents the chariot wheel. There's a schematic of it. Surrounded by 50 some small hearth rings, each with 10 stones. And we excavate those hearth rings. 
and in all of them we find a small amount of animal bones charred. So the idea is that the families around came to celebrate the burial of an important person and had food and left a little bit as an offering. These date from the Bronze Age. Here's a few of our excavators with a number of students excavating up on Balut 2, a burial that turned out to be from the Middle Ages, from the time of Chinggis Khan. So we like to say we found his burial. Everybody's been searching for his burial for ages. We like to say we found it. We have teams of Americans, Chinese, and Mongolians, all working together as teams regularly. Here, lying down on the right, is my uh, colleague, my partner, research partner, Bill Fitzhugh. He's the director of the Smithsonian Institution's Arctic Studies Center. He's the world's leading Arctic anthropologist. And he came to Mongolia about the same time that I did, and we hooked up later in 2007 since we've been working together. He'd never been out west and he was shocked by the myriad kind of forms of Puritans and monuments that were out there that he hadn't seen in as many years in uh, Central Mongolia. So here we're excavating a burial. You can see what they're beginning to reveal. This was a man who was over six feet tall. This was very surprising. I look at this and I wonder what what world did he see? What world did he know? They prized their horses and they buried the prized horses of the head chieftains alongside of the human body. They laid the horses out beside him or her. And we found inside one of the horse skulls. The bell, the horse bell. I found this iron arrowhead slightly sticking up out of the ground right beside a large boulder. And I believe that it got bent because it actually struck that boulder. And then lay in the ground for thousands of years until Koro comes along and plucks it out. We have uncovered some pottery from the Pazric burials, which are very deep, unlike the Bronze Age Hyrixes. We found hidden underneath a wooden coffin in a Pazric grave, these gold foil are golly heads, or golly sheep. About the size of a silver dollar. <coughs> very beautiful. In case you're wondering, these are now the uh, Mongolian National Museum. But it's not all work. It was time off, lunch and evenings, for other pursuits, like fishing, to supplement our diet. Our neighbors are boiling horse milk, which is their staple. which they make yogurt, it's a delicious yogurt to die for. And cheeses of all kinds, very delicious cheeses. So here again, here again is our project area, blue to one, two, and three, the yellow designates where the petroglyphs are found. And here's a view shed map of the same hills. Blue three is by far the largest and tallest but the largest concentration of petroglyphs is found on the western side of Belut 1. This is a, again a, a view shed of just Belut 3, and those, those dots represent the location where there are Mongolian deer petroglyphs that look like the Mongolian deer on the deer stones. 
This was my first morning out west at the site. We woke up to a heavy snowfall and my heart sunk. I thought we were done for. But the sun came out and dried it away by afternoon and we were off and running. It's extremely cold there, I hate especially. And it snows even in mid-July. It's so high and far north. Cattle are crowding around the family's air. This is what they live in. It's a tent with felt covered by canvas. Very simple but ingenious well, which they can put up in about an hour and a half and take down in an hour and they're gone. So this is the western face of Palute One facing the lake mountains and you can see the dark patches. Those are exposed patches of bedrock which the glacier scoured and brought into view. And on those, the petroglyph makers left their marks. Here is one from the side. Can you see that? What we call a panel. So they're right at your feet. You walk over them and you have to be careful not to step on them and scratch them because that will do permanent damage. The lake is at about 7,000 feet. So when we start going up into the mountain for the Petrobus, we're going up 8,000, 9,000 feet. Here's the last of the tail end of the giant mountain warrior from the Turkic period. Can you see the, can you see the rider on the horse? I can't get the point of it, sorry. But the giant horse you can see in the center, and right on top is a thin spidery rider. So to make it clearer, there's one. Disturbs. That's how we know it's a Turkic period. Archaeologists have determined that Serbs did not come into being until the Turkic people. And this particular rock, which is gigantic, is really fascinating because you can only see the horses and riders at a certain time of day, at a certain angle when the sun shines on it at a particular angle, either in the morning or the evening. So here's a tracing of a couple of the horses and riders. Very spidery like. Wearing interesting headgear. A crescent. A full disc. Can you see the can you see the large horse? It has a band across its neck? very stylized rendering. This is uh, about a meter and a half long. This is a moose, one of the most beautiful images. It looks like it could have been carved in contemporary times. Very stylish, very elegant. It's also a camel, if you can see the two humps. There are many figures that are or sympathize or combined figures which we, we feel has some kind of religious significance. There are a lot of hunt scenes, human beings hunting animals. You see the archer to the left chasing a stag and the dogs trying to bite at it. And over on the far right are the two vertical lines, which is probably a barrier. They're probably chasing this deer into a barrier. 
make it easier to bring down. Four arches at the top and at the bottom right, going after ibex, mountain goats. There are not very, there are not very many birds. There are only about nine or maybe ten images of birds. Usually quite small. And here's some of them. There are Tonga, which are a kind of clan sign or insignia, marking possession or a boundary. And these are famous throughout Central Asia. They either mark territory or possession, and they're still used today to mark a family's animals, saddles, and other possessions. And I think we, we have about 17 Tonga at this site. There's a photograph of one of the others were representation. You can see that how small it is. On the right is the scale. The tip of the arrow to the bottom is only 10 centimeters. So that's about four and a half inches. And these are sometimes found in the strangest places. We're off the beaten track, as it were. It's hard to see what they would have been marking. Here we have probably Paleolithic 